How's everybody doing? Welcome back to my office. I know it's been a while since you've seen my, my mug. I've been doing a lot of Tool Tuesday and screen uh, screenshot videos. Um, for those who've been checking out for my OSCP videos, I, uh, I just renewed for 30 days only so far today. So I'm back at it. Um, I'll continue those as, uh, as I, I'll continue those. And uh, so, but what I wanted to talk about today, what I wanted to get into today uh, is something perhaps maybe most people who want to break into cyber security uh, may wonder about or have questions about. If you're on the job search and you, let's say you have a degree and you have some certifications, um, but you keep seeing this thing about RMF in most of the cyber job postings, uh, I'm going to talk about what is RMF. Um, I've only been doing it for a year. Oh, I've basically been doing it for a year, but prior to that, I, I did DiaCat for seven years, which is is basically uh, essentially the same thing. It's um, DiaCat was what is an outdated process, and RMF is the new process. Um, so I'm only a year in, but uh, I can speak on it and I can I break down in a high level overview because I have been doing it for eight years or so. Basically, RMF stands for, it's an acronym for Risk Management Framework. Um, it's a process organizations, primarily DOD, follow to implement cybersecurity and best practices and security in depth in their organizations, in their security programs, in their IT programs, on their systems and networks. Um, basically, it's so at, at its bare bones, it's a way to create a dialogue and or better understanding of a system, of a network, of an application, um, and m basically go by a predetermined set of guidelines, controls to secure it. Um, it's not sexy most of the time. Uh, it's, it, you know, a typical day of RMF work. It's a lot of reading, meetings, uh, agendas, uh, emails, documentation, and then there there is technical aspects of it. Um, but it's 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 definitely necessary um, for an organization to better understand the security posture of their system or network. Uh, but again, it's far from sexy. So diving in a little bit further as far as what is RMF Risk Management Framework. It's a way for organizations and the decision makers in an organization to assess risk based on the type of system they own, uh, the type of work that they do, the level of risk if information gets out or their system is compromised. And so it kind of prioritizes based on the criticality of those things, uh, you know, those, the, the, what they're doing, uh, the classification of the system, and it helps them better understand their posture and start to harden or secure those controls based on the level of criticality, uh, you know, what is more critical to control or to secure versus something that is, is uh, categorized at a, at a low setting. So if something would happen to that system or that control, it'd be okay. Uh, the consequences wouldn't be so great as if a high criticality issue vulnerability was exploited. Um, there's six steps to it. I'm not going to jump into the steps. Uh, let's say you have two systems. One system is just a basic public site, public facing web server, you know, has basic information, unclassified information, nothing really serious going on, it's not really important. And then you have another system which is has classified information, it's very sensitive, uh, you know, you want to tighten that down and uh, if the information which you leak or get spilled out or whatever the case have you, it could be bad for the organization, bad for the country, whatever. Um, you're not going to, using the RMF process, you're not going to protect those two systems the same way. Um, there's a, a categorization process, as I mentioned. Uh, you sh if you're in cybersecurity, you should know the CIA, you know, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. We, when we do the RMF process, we classify those three concepts with either low, medium, or high. Um, so for instance, if you're the first system, you're just a website, a public facing website, there's no classified information. If the system were to go down or be compromised, the risk to your organization is very low. 
So an example might be you might classify your CIA as low, 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 and basically you're not going to protect that system as much or invest as, as much protection in that system as you would the classified. Let's say the classified system has, uh, is, let's say you classify it as high, high, high because of the information that's stored on it or what have you. Um, you're obviously going to spend more money and, and, and invest more in security for that system. And so that's what the RMF process does. It helps decision makers understand their, their system, their network, and protect it to the maximum ability of the organization's funding. So funding is a huge part of RMF. Um, a lot of decisions, unfortunately, are based upon funding. So uh, in my experience, I won't get into specifics about any system particularly, but most, uh, a, lot of, a lot of decision makers will choose to not implement a control based on the simple fact of funding. They can't afford it. Um, from their risk assessment, they determined it, it wasn't worth implementing the control because the uh, the consequence or the you know the probability of that uh, exploit being well, that vulnerability being exploited is really low, <coughs> so they will just won't put the money into it. Um, an example I can give is, um, and I'll do probably try to have like some type of illustration or some. Hopefully that works out for you guys, but. Let's say you have, a, you have a computer system, a network, between two buildings. You have building A and building B. Um, the buildings are secure, okay? So uh, physical security is there. Uh, security is in the building. You know, you're not worried technically about any type of spillage from the building. So it's physical security. Traditional security is set. However, uh, you have personnel in these two buildings that need to communicate, need to talk to each other. And... Uh, let's say it is a classified system. Obviously, you're not going to do wireless. Wireless, as we all know, is very, very exploitable. You don't want, even if it's encrypted, you just don't want anybody grabbing classified wireless out the air. So you're going to have a wired connection. Let's say you have a wired connection between two buildings. Um, now, in doing so, there, you know, in, in implementing the LMF process, there's, a, there's a, a questionnaire or checklist type that'll break down your, your security attributes and say, hey, okay, do you have communication lines between two endpoints for this instance? The obvious, um, the obvious answer would be yes. Okay, so how are you protecting it? Well, there's a couple of ways. Um, you can place it in a PDS, which is a conduit, you know, place the, the Ethernet or transmission, or however you're transmitting it through the wire between the two buildings. You can protect it that way. Um, but then there's, there's also... Uh, funding you know uh, you have to buy the conduit and you have to get contractors and a lot of that costs money so let's say um, you do your risk assessment or the organization does a risk assessment to determine if it's worth protecting that line that communication line with PDS and encryption devices on the ends um, you know so when uh, the data goes through the wire from building to building, it's encrypted, and then it gets encrypted or decrypted on the other side. So those encryption devices cost money too. So all that plays into how you are going to spend money to protect your assets, protect your information. Now let's say the two buildings were, it was an unclassified system, really nothing going on much there. They, they were still using a wire, but they didn't decide, uh, well, they decided not to encrypt the information and protect it through PDS because the, the risk was low. You know, if somebody were to tap into the wire between the buildings, uh, a leakage of that information is not necessarily detrimental to the organization, so they're not going to spend the money on encryption devices and a PDS. So RMF is the process that helps decision makers, again, make decisions like that. RMF is definitely a huge learning curve. Um, it is great to understand the NIST the NIST guidance, the 853 alpha, and to read those um, those DOD directives and government documents. Um, if you're in, if you want to break into cybersecurity, I I recommend. I feel like it's a good starting point for general knowledge of how to protect the system, even from a high level overview. Because again, um, RMF, I feel personally, you know, I could be wrong, but it's my my personal feeling. RMF is more geared towards the decision makers, you know, they have worker bees, network admins, sys admins, mostly cybersecurity uh, professionals implement RMF and do the process from one to six, 
uh, handle the documentation, but it's ultimately up to the decision makers to to uh, make the decision on what they want to do. So m usually the worker bee guys aren't making decisions. They're just documentation. They're doing documentation. They're providing uh, assessments and they're providing suggestions, uh, professional suggestions to the decision makers um, because usually they just want to either spend the money or not. Um, and they also want to understand their security posture at the same time. So um, if you're looking to get into cybersecurity, I suggest brushing up on RMF. I can, I can, yeah, I can provide some documents, some links in the comments. Um, it's definitely important. Uh, it's not as technical, but I find most technical people un that understand RMF process can speak on the controls a lot better than someone who it maybe isn't technical. So, you know, when you're reading a control, you're trying to understand a particular concept of, uh, of a control. Uh, if you don't know what it's saying, obviously you're going to have difficulty understanding how to implement the control. Um, I, what I would say about the controls, about the NIST uh, 853 Alpha is the wording, I, I particularly uh, frown upon a lot of the wording. It is confusing. I feel like sometimes you need an English major or a lawyer degree to understand the controls, but you know, after you, you go through and you read them on and on, over and over, assessing different systems or your particular system, uh, you'll start to catch up and you'll start to understand what it is that they're asking for. So if you uh, you want to break into cyber and you're seeing those job postings and they're they're talking about RMF and DIACAP and CNA and documentation, that's basically what the job entails. Um, there's multiple aspects. You can be a network admin, a security or a system admin, a security manager, or an IA, information assurance professional. And all those guys have some type of responsibility to the RMF process if that is something your organization is is utilizing uh, to protect their systems. There's other frameworks out there. Um, DOD, to my understanding, uh, mainly uses RMF. Some other organizations, public organizations, may, may use RMF, uh, but it's definitely a government standard. It's a NIST standard. Um, if you can gather or get the concepts and understand the process and understand the ultimate goal. Uh, I think you can do great in, in cyber. Uh, it's not the all, do all, be all. As I said, it's not that sexy, but it is important and it does pay very well. Um, as I understand, a lot of organizations out there are looking for RMF specialists. So if that's something in your interest, I definitely would go that route. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, what is RMF? Um, please stay tuned. I will definitely get back on the OSCP blogs. Um, if you like this video, please like, share, subscribe, and I will see you soon. Thanks.